16. Indians and Anthropologists There are some anthropologists whose writings are intelligent and accurate up to a point, but there is a serious problem in anthropological studies and in science generally, which leads to a serious perversion of reality. I'm not talking just about the works of people like Margaret Mead, exposed as a fraud by Freeman, but still treated as an, quote, authority, end quote. There is also John Nance's The Gentle Tassaday, a Stone Age people in the Philippine rainforest, with a foreword by Charles A. Lindbergh, 1975, which many claimed on a variety of grounds to be a hoax, but which was republished in 1988. Again and again, quote-unquote, scientists have been determined to, quote-unquote, discover the natural good man, untainted by Christianity. The American Indians have been a frequent candidate for this sort of revisionism. First of all, the approach to the many so-called primitive peoples is anti-historical. Can we treat the English of today, or those of the Venerable Bede's day, the same as the naked, blue-painted warriors the Romans encountered? The idea is absurd. The same is true of the American Indians. A static notion is absurd. The coming of the white man created a ripple effect from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Even more, the arrival and capture of Spanish horses revolutionized American Indian life. Those in the West who got horses first immediately became, quote, advanced, end quote. The horse was more responsible for changes in Indian life than anything else. Second, American Indian life was not static and unchanging. There was no commitment to a mythical, quote, primitive, end quote, lifestyle that bound them to the past. Tribes learned quickly from each other and from the French, English, Spanish and Americans. They were not stupid like white nativists. They were ready to improve their lives. They had less commitment to their past than did the white men. The Shoshone and Paiute's life I knew in the 1940s and early 1950s was not the life they lived in 1900, nor are they the same now, 1992. A fixed idea of Indian life and culture is absurd. Third, apart from a dedication to their faith in primitivism and environmentalism, many scholars in this area, as in others, strive to be value-free, meaning really anti-Christian. Consider this statement by John Manship White, quote, Polyandry, the system whereby a woman was the wife of more than one man, is not attested in North America, though Eskimo tribesmen were in the habit of offering their wives for the sexual pleasure of the guests, and the Shoshonean women were permitted by certain tribes to have sexual intercourse with other members of the tribe while their husbands were away hunting. End quote. This is not a lie, but neither is it the truth. No Shoshone man wanted to share his wife or daughter with any other man. I knew one Shoshone woman whose nose had been cut off by her husband for adultery. This was an ancient punishment, although not always used. White's statement is false because it is, quote, scientific, end quote, that is, value-free, and therefore a distortion and a lie. In a band of Indians, a small group of families, a leader could order some men to hunt while others protected the camp. As the strong man, the leader could take another man's wife, knowing that the husband was in no position to challenge his authority or position. The husband's, quote, consent, end quote, was pragmatic and life-preserving, nothing more. Any move for revenge would have led to anarchy and mass killings. Similarly, when white men first appeared in the scene, their technological superiority was at once apparent. Various choices were open to the Indians. They could kill the stranger or strangers and take everything. Usually, however, before first encountering a white man, most Indians had heard of them and their numbers, their killing power, and their very valuable goods. More than a few tribes, in fact most, found it wiser to accommodate the white man. More than a few of the leaders of Indian uprisings were regarded by many of their peoples as foolhardy and suicidal. Curiously, these men are the men our Americans often honour, sometimes calling them chiefs, which they were not.
When the white man came to an encampment where the Indians were determined to be friendly, the Indians stressed trade and peace. Peace could mean access to Indian women. Venereal disease often passed both ways, from whites to Indians and from Indians to whites. A great deal of the sexual availability of the Indian woman rested on the simple fact that it was part of an effort to keep potentially dangerous visitors happy and to extract gifts from them. The Lewis and Clark expedition reported that some tribesmen gave their wives to elderly warriors and hunters on a temporary basis or to a powerful stranger in the hope that the abilities of the man could be transferred to the woman thereby. It is questionable whether men have ever offered their women to other men unless they expected to get something in return. My point is that white statements, while accurate, is value-free and hence false. It gives a warped picture of Indian life. During the Depression of the 1930s, when I was a student, I knew more than one graduate student who prospered by making his wife available to a key faculty member. With some homosexual professors, the student, quote, got ahead, end quote, by making himself available. I had a passing acquaintance with a couple who both held easy federal jobs, she under her maiden name because married women were less likely to be employed. The quote-unquote boss, head of a minor office with four or five men under him, was very soon adulterously involved with the young woman. She would leave work an hour early at the boss's request, and he would follow soon afterward to join her in her apartment before he went home. Both husband and wife put up with it because jobs were scarce, but it soon ended their marriage. This job blackmail, if described in the professor's value-free language as typical of American life in the 1930s, would be factually correct, while being an outrageous lie. I'm not saying that American moral standards in the 1930s and American Indian standards circa 1800 are comparable. Rather, we must insist that neither can be discussed value-free. When men gave their wives to others, the purpose was pragmatic. It was either self-protection or it was to gain something from the other man. On the reservation, if the adultery took place without permission, and this was common, the husband became angry and vented his anger on his wife. Adultery was common, and it was considered wrong, no matter how prone all were to it. Indians grew to be sceptical of scholars and found them frustrating. Say we were to meet a university researcher doing a, quote, definitive, end quote, study of the U.S. Constitutional Convention in terms of the use of snuff, liquor and tobacco by the delegates, giving a detailed analysis of utensils and dress. We would consider this man with disdain. His book would tell us nothing valuable about either the Constitution or its architects. One woman, Jessie Little, very superior and gracious, but regrettably involved in the peyote cult, was an, quote, informant, end quote, to an anthropologist before my time on the reservation. He found her resistant to some of his questions. She told me that he was not at all interested in what she had to say, but interested only in answers to his, quote, stupid, end quote, questions. He had come with an agenda, with a preconceived framework about the reality of peyote life, and he wanted to concentrate on that. Too full of themselves and lacking empathy, anthropologists too often assumed that the older Indians could not distinguish between myth and history. They imposed Darwinian presuppositions upon their subjects. They asked their set of questions and left. With some rare exceptions, the academicians hated Christians and missionaries. They were bigots who believed themselves the only wise and enlightened ones. Indians are not stupid. Whatever their faults, they lack neither feelings nor intelligence. To be treated like flora and fauna to be studied was for many of them offensive, and for some a source of pain. I have mentioned the Indian's readiness to change. He very quickly picked up the vague public Christianity of Americans and, as far as possible, conformed his life to it. He has just as quickly picked up the modern culture of television, rock and roll and more to his own hurt. 
The revolution in Indian life since World War II has been dramatic. The cult of primitivism and Indianization has spread rapidly. We now have a younger generation of Indians and agitators whose model of Indian derives from American liberal mythology. These new Indians have become actors, playing an expected part and accepting as true a vast realm of white American mythology about the Indian past. This vision of the Indian past is a static one, as is the vision of our white American primitivists and environmentalists. They are interested in more than just turning back the clock. They call for a return to a timeless fairy land which has existed only in their imaginations. A vision based on a candid realism moves history forward. One based on mythology surrenders and destroys it.